Welcome to Stewardology, a podcast where two worlds collide. In this show, financial advisor Tim Russell and Reverend Drew Geisey come together to explore the intersection of financial stewardship and theology. Their unique perspectives help Christians and churches understand and apply a biblical framework for everyday financial decisions so Christians everywhere can improve and strengthen their walk with Christ through biblical stewardship. Before we get started, we just wanted you to know that the topics discussed in this podcast are for general information only and are not intended to provide specific investment advice or recommendations. Investing and investment strategies involve risk, including the potential loss of principal. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results. Securities and advisory services are offered through Genio's Wealth Management, member FINRA and CIPIC. Without further ado, here are your hosts, Tim Russell and Drew Geisey. I'm Tim Russell. And I'm Pastor Drew Geisey. And we welcome you to episode 60 of The The Stewardology Stewardology Podcast. Podcast. Tim, today's episode, we're talking about talking to your adult children about money and money management. Now, we know that some of our listeners may not have adult children. So we're going to play part of that role. If your parents haven't spoken to you about those things, we're going to have that opportunity to speak into you about things that you should probably know. Am I right in saying that, Tim? Yeah, I mean, the, the bottom line here is is we're trying to to help Parents know how to continue to financially parent their children into their adult years. Yeah. And at the same time, struggle with the reality that the majority of our listeners are their kids. Yes. Probably not the parents. So if you are, you know, in your 50s, 60s or later and have adult children and and want to know what does parenting look like for me at this stage, this episode is for you. If you are one of their children, if you are in your, you know, adult stage from 18 to maybe mid 50s, this episode is for you. Yeah. Because we're going to be providing to you the advice that your parents should be giving you or would give you if they knew to. So if you want, you can actually send this podcast to your parents. Tell <laughs> tell them Let's to have a conversation. tell them to listen to it and then set up a conversation over dinner that they're cooking so you can go over there and hang out with them. <laughs> they're cooking. That they're cooking. You know, might as well do that. So, but you know, as parents We are to be the main teachers for our kids and pass on a variety of wisdom and knowledge. And one key arena of wisdom that we ought to pass on to our kids, it's about money, Mm -hmm. finances, stewardship, according to what the scriptures say. We need to do that. And parenting doesn't end when the kids get out of the home, especially financial parenting. That doesn't end. My kids are in their late 20s. And... My wife and I are still having those money conversations with both of our kids and encouraging them. And we're not we're not funneling money their way, but we are encouraging them as they bring up questions. And as we see what they're doing, we try to step in Mm -hmm. and guide them, which is a good thing. And I tend to see this less and less in families. They're discussing money. And Tim, maybe you can touch on this real quick. But what I'm seeing is. Adults are flying by the seat of their pants when it comes to their own money and money management, and they're feeling like they're hypocrites to be able to sit down with their own children and talk about this no matter what age bracket, whether you're in the 60s, 70s plus, or whether in your 30s. And you, you, you want to talk to them about it, but you've made so many mistakes and so many problems, or you're in problematic areas right now. Uh, I don't want yeah, to jump in yeah. there and do that. Uh, yeah, you know, you've seen that, haven't you? I, I have. And uh, so with an honest conversation with your kids, I think even acknowledging the present realities of, of the consequences of the choices that you've made yes. or, or the things that you decided not to do because you had so many other things going on and now you're dealing with the consequences of that had you known then what you know now, you would have done things differently. That, that parent who has the, the ability to step back and to, to provide that kind of context will be enormously helpful for their kids. I, kids already know their parents are not perfect. What? 
Actually, you know, the ironic thing is when when your kids are young, say pre-10, you're their superhero. You can do anything. My dad can bend a fork. My dad can bend a knife. My dad can bend a a steel bar. My dad can bend a tree in half. You know, everyone's got that. I think that's probably pre-7, not 10. You know, (laughs) so they're they're getting – yeah, the culture is changing. Kids are changing. I understand that. Um, but once they get into their teenage years, yeah. parents begin to know less and less and less. And all of a sudden, once they get into college, maybe out of college, for some reason, your parents get smarter as you get older. You realize, actually, maybe they know a thing or two about life that I don't know. So the parent who can who can speak into that and can help that child who's seeking for wisdom really has an opportunity of, of changing some trajectories of that family tree. And that's, that's what we want to do here with this podcast, this episode, we want to help see some change happen and hopefully cultivate some discussions within the family. Yeah. So as we start off here, I got three questions that begin with the word what, and we're going to discuss this, take a look at it, but also uh, look at some scripture that, that ties in with it. So the first what question is, what is the goal of training this next generation, the generation that's younger than us, no matter what age we are yeah. at? And Tim, there's a great passage of scripture we have shared so many times, but we keep running back to it because it is the word of God. It's true. So what is that passage? Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. You know, this is a wonderful proverb and a very helpful and instructive piece of advice that we need to take very seriously. The the young years of our children's development to instruct them in the way that they should go. And generally true, obviously not universally true, you all know stories of those exceptions. Uh, kids who have been instructed well in a well-nurtured family do tend to grow up in uh, a believing manner, you know, working out yep. their salvation throughout the rest of their lives. It's not a promise, right? It's not a mechanistic no. promise. There are exceptions. Kids sometimes do go astray, even in good, well-rounded families. Yes. But this is the general way God has made the world. And we need to have that expectation that when we teach and instruct our kids— this will have long-term benefits to them. That's so well said. And the next passage I want to look at is Proverbs 3.1. Really, the beginning part of the, that passage, it says, My son, do not forget my teaching. So what is the goal of training the next generation? So that they will remember the teachings. And I want to kind of emphasize here, we are the teachers. We as parents are the teachers. We are the primary, according to Scripture, the primary ones that are pouring into the lives of our kids. No matter what age they are at, we are the one teaching them. And hopefully, as we teach them, as we share with them what's going on, money, finance, stewardship, as they get older, they will remember these things. You can't forget something that you've never learned. Ooh, Tim, say that again. You I can't like that. forget something that you've never learned. So it says, do not forget my teachings. Well, that implies that they have been taught. That implies that the parents have taken the time to instruct them in the ways of the Lord, to yeah. instruct them in in the faith. Obviously, that's the most important thing for our kids to learn and understand, but also in basic financial wisdom, as is borne out in many, many places throughout the book of Proverbs. Yeah. So that is, what is the goal of training the next generation? So next is, what is the risk if we are not proactive? Tim, read Proverbs twenty one twenty. In the house of the wise are stores of choice food and oil, but the fool devours all he has. In a nutshell, it's not in the house of the rich that there are stores and reserves. It is not the wealthy who have reserves primarily, but the Bible describes it as in the house of the wise. Yeah. That's really important. But then notice how he contrasts it with what the fool does. And we don't want our children to be the fool. 
We don't want them to devour all he has. The word devour is the same word that's used when the great fish swallowed up Jonah. It's to gobble it all up. There's yeah. nothing left. When the fool gets his income and all of his his you know his resources come into his his care, he's devouring it. He's consuming it. He's living on it all. That's where the wisdom of never spending it all having some in reserves, setting some aside is a sign of wisdom, not wealth. I have met so many families who have never made more than fifty to $70,000 a year, and yet there is no debt and they have some savings. That is a sign of wisdom, mm. not wealth. Well said. You don't have to have wealth to have savings. Tim, well, well said. Another passage of scripture is Proverbs fifteen six. It says, "The house of the righteous contains great treasure, but the income of the wicked brings them trouble." So, what is the risk if we're not proactive in teaching the, and training the next generation? They very well could take their income, and whether it's much or little, and bring harm to themselves and their family. And to the family name, because you're connected with them. So one of those things is if we're not training and teaching them how to use their and steward their finances in the right biblical, godly way, it could bring destruction and and just problematic issues, not just for their immediate family, but for you as parents also. And then in Luke 15, 14, it says, and after he had spent everything, there was a famine in the whole country and he began to be in need. And after he spent everything, Tim, I understand that there's that in your life, you had a a story where you tried to spend everything and your dad told you, take the money and (laughs) run it back inside. Am I right in saying that? (laughs) Sure. Uh, When we were young we were going on a vacation I remember we were getting in the minivan we were driving down to florida and uh, uh you know i went and grabbed all of my short-term savings grabbed it all all put it in my pocket put you know we ran out to the car broke the piggy and, bank. and my dad goes okay so how much is left in the piggy bank <laughs> i looked at him i said your question does not compute <laughs> i'm going on vacation <laughs> and i want money to spend in the arcades you know i had i had my life goals my priorities yeah and and he, he said no you never spend it all you always have reserves get out of the car go put some back your dad was instilling in you this passage yeah and it's obviously a lesson that i've learned and i and i understand well you know this this lesson here right the after he had spent it all this is the prodigal son yeah. there are two important lessons to keep in mind here first lesson is that famines often come as a sign of god's judgment well said. No, not always. Not always. Uh, but but Often. so very many times we see in Scripture within the prophets that famines are one of the ways in which God tries to get our attention. And I believe this is true also for this prodigal son. So that is an attention call. It's a wake-up call. Say, hey, dummy, what are you doing with your life? You're wasting right. it. Now, the second thing to note here is that famines are not always a sign of God's particular displeasure on you, but is maybe just the result of living in a world that's groaning with eager expectations, looking for the return of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. We live in a fallen world. So therefore we need to look ahead, foresee a danger, not spend all that you have because there may be a famine coming. You need to be prepared. Yeah. And that's, that's something that's always in the back of my mind. And I'm constantly trying to think through, you know, when is those, when are those leaner days going to come? My wife and I, we've lived through lean days through ministry and we've taken major pay cuts because of ministry and we're okay with that. But we've always, God has always provided what we've needed because we've always prepared for those days. Mm -hmm. So what is the goal of training the next generation? We answered that. What is the risk if we are not proactive? But Tim, what is the benefit of being proactive in training this next generation with finances and stewardship. Yeah, Third John 4 is great. It says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Oh, you love know, that. As, as we as parents yeah. invest into the lives of our children, it brings us such joy to see that they are taking the wisdom and the information and it is benefiting their lives. 
that they are are growing in Christ and that they are well adjusted adults. Yeah, I I love that. And there's a few more passages of scripture we're going to put it on our website that you can take a look at. But I want to come in and start looking at first part is laying that foundation. Now, we don't want to spend a lot of time sitting on this one, but Tim, would you start us yeah. off there talking about laying this foundation of stewardship and biblical stewardship I, and for our adult children, yeah. but this goes back way before that, of being yeah. adult. Ideally, ideally, you would have started this process back when they were just little guys. Yeah. You know, maybe when they were five, six years old, starting to go to school, you're going to start teaching them about money, teaching them about how to use money and use it properly. Um, you know, we have an episode we'll be referring to later where we get into the four quarter method of stewardship. Yeah. And, and it is a great way of introducing some of the basic concepts of financial stewardship, biblical financial service that we're going to give, we're going to save, we're going to spend in an appropriate way. Right. You may be sitting here and saying, well, Tim, you're telling me start it early. My kids are in their 20s, 30s, and 40s. <laughs> Is it too late? The answer is no. It's actually, it's not too late. Absolutely. I mean, yes, there's always benefits to starting early, but no matter where you are, it's water over the dam, water under the bridge. You got to start with what you've got. Right. So I would point you to some resources that I think are going to be very valuable to you. Number one is this podcast. I, I really think this podcast can be an enormous help in helping to lay the foundation of biblical stewardship in the lives of your children. So refer them to the podcast, refer them to specific episodes. So I, I have a couple that I'd love for them to understand <laughs> the episode two through seven yeah. deals with laying the foundation of biblical stewardship, give, save, spend offerings, luxuries. Those are so helpful and such a critical part of our core teaching. Episode nine deals with surprise generosity. And we get into the four quarter method of yeah. stewardship that we talked about just a moment ago. Yes. Uh, these are some really great episodes and there's so many others, and whether it's compound interest or um, you know, worry, budgeting, debt elimination, there's so many beneficial episodes. I would highly encourage you to go back and look at now. Okay. Who has hours of their their day, week, month, or year that they're going to spend in listening to a podcast? Maybe, not everyone. I right. understand that. Right. Well, one of the ways that you can help get your kids into what is going on here is to invite Life Institute, our teaching arm, to come into your church. It's not designed to be a, a commercial, but I do believe it's an important resource. Come into the church so that we can do a stewardship lifestyle seminar. This is a three-day in-church seminar where we go into churches around the country, the United States, and we teach about biblical stewardship. If you have questions about that, feel free to reach out to us or go to lifeinstitute.org to learn more. There's another book that we think is really helpful, and it's called Raising Financially Confident Kids by Mary Hunt. There'll be a link in the show notes if you are interested. There's no affiliate link. It's just, you know, I love the book. It can be very helpful. And a last resource. Oh, wait, drum wait, roll, wait, please. wait, wait. This first is first time Brent, announced. First time big information coming. Ready? We're writing a book. What? Roy, my, my father, Roy, and I are writing a book that is designed to be a primer, a a summary of some of our core teachings so that if if you are looking for something to help instruct your children to go deeper in that relationship with them financially and and personally, this book is going to be something that I I hope and pray will enable and facilitate that. Uh, Lord willing, this book will be published late next year. So there'll be much more to come on that book as we go through uh, the next eight to nine months. Uh, but uh, that's something to be looking forward to. Christmas presents for 2022. There you go. If you want to make sure that you don't miss any announcements about this upcoming book, make sure you go to our website and subscribe to our mailing list Yes, so that you do not miss any of the announcements about that book or future podcast episodes. Sounds great. So we're going to switch gears. We're going to now talk about young adult, or maybe you got like a college student, or maybe they're at home and they're working. 
we want to look at some of the ways that we can, these financial lessons for parenting these adult children. And if they're not in school, they should be working and paying some form of rent. Am I right in saying that, Tim? So if your kid is now an adult and they're still living at home because they haven't really figured out the whole career thing yet, God bless them. I I hope they can um, be able to stay in your home and, and build a nice foundation. That's a good thing to do. But they should be paying rent if they're not in college or trade school or something like that. Yeah. Um. I really want them to understand that there is no entitlement for them to be living in your home. Exactly. Uh, you want to encourage them and bless them, but they need to be contributing members of your household if they are working. If they have income coming in, they need to be sharing some of that with the household because they are now an adult. Now, um, what my dad did is he said it, the going rate for an apartment, a one-bedroom apartment around here is X. 50% of that's what I'll charge you. Right. That that could be a good rule of thumb. Use your own wisdom and discretion. Obviously, you make your decisions. I know when I was 18 years old, I moved out of the house. I got a job that was willing to pay me enough to have a, a living wage to be able to put a roof over my head, a rent up in North Jersey. And that's where, and so at 18, I moved out of the house not to move back in again. Yeah. So I wound up paying real rent, not, uh, not half rent. Yeah. Tyler, you had something you wanted to add here. I did this when I was living at home after college. I actually paid rent into a savings account, which I got the sum of when I got married and moved out. Oh, that's awesome. That's nice. So you treating for lunch today? <laughs> it wasn't too much, but it was it was something that helped as they were transition as I was transitioning into a more independent function. Of well, he, he just got married, so I figured he would be treating to lunch today if he got that windfall of cash. So what's the goal of rent? Yeah. What's the goal of rent? It's not to get rich off of your kids. It's to develop within them the habits of consistency, the habit of being responsible Responsible. for your own situation in life. So it's developing character. Exactly. We also want to talk about with your college student or, or child at home, allowance ends at 18 or after high school. But you may still want to offer support with some basic needs for college. If like, they're in college. If they're in college, and that would be like clothing, food, insurance, and yeah. stuff. Give them responsibility with it, though. Don't let them just have it be an entitlement aspect. Yeah. So I think that's an important piece. So, so notice point number one is if they're not in college or trade school, they're at home and they're working. Correct. Charge them rent. Exactly. If if they're in college or trade school, you don't need to charge them rent. Like I get that. That right. that's okay. That can be part of the whole package. If you want to charge them rent, that's fine too. But just you know, use your judgment, your wisdom. But it's no, there's no allowance. You don't need to give them an allowance, but you can offer support to help them with various essentials as they get through college, such as clothing and things like that. Exactly. But never let it, never allow it to become an entitlement mentality. You do not want to give your kids the idea that they get to live at home and live off of mom and dad in perpetuity. Uh, the goal really needs to be on their own as soon as they are mature and able to do so. Well said, well said. Plus, we also, another one is to discourage or prohibit co-signing. And this would be for first car, college, trade school. Tim, talk a little bit about this. We're going to do a future podcast episode to go more in detail on on co-signing. The Bible actually says in multiple places that co-signing is not wise, that co-signing is actually detrimental and something that Christians should not do. So we're going to tackle that topic and we're going to address it in more detail. But in summary, essentially what co-signing is, is, is my kid has no credit history. He has no loans in his name or her name already. So I'm going to use my good name, my good credit to secure a loan for them. And if they don't make good on that payment, I have to stand in and make good on that payment. The Bible says that we aren't to do that. So, we should be modeling that and don't be reactionary. Don't wait for them to come back with the application, say, I can get the loan as long as you co-sign it. Mm. We should be talking about, by the way, co-signing is a thing. This is why we don't do it. Don't ask me to co-sign a loan for you. Now, I understand that with college, it's particularly problematic because in some instances, they may not be able to get a loan except through co-signing. So 
We'll talk through some of that in an upcoming episode. You know, we also need to teach our our adult children, teach them about financially planning for the future. And Tim, this is really your realm. So I want to punt over yeah, to you. Yeah. What are some of the key things that you would share with a, a couple that have a young adult living in their home, things that they need to discuss with their kids? Well, I mean, so they're in college, right? The first thing they should probably be talking about is what is a reasonable or acceptable plan for getting through college financially, especially with debt. Yes. Okay. So is debt an option or not? Is if debt is an option for you and your family, and I would, I would encourage you to, that it's not an option, but that's some of the realities that you, you know, you're just not ready for it and you have to get through it. And there's debt involved and we understand that. Um, but if, if there's debt involved, how much Yes. are you going to let them go? sky's the limit are you are you gonna let your kids be like the 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 young couple that i met who were in their 30s not able to buy a home or be on their own living in um as cheap an apartment kind of situation as it could because they were both with grad school level educations Mm. and working in restaurants wow as as like wait staff and things like that now they couldn't start a family because they had mortgage sized debts, each of them. Wow. Each of them. Each of them. Wow. Their parents, and this is one of the things that they sat down and talked to me about, their parents never talked to them about money or what's appropriate. They had no concept that when they were getting all of these loans, that they would have this small starting salary and this massive mortgage size payment that they're going to be paying on perhaps for the rest of their lives if they're not able to make progress. Wow. Talk to them about the wisdom about how much we're going to spend on college. Help them with a budget and the plan. Um, think about how to spend for a wedding. Is the sky's the limit or is there a budget? How much are you going to help them with? How much are they going to be responsible for? What about for buying a first home? Uh, do they understand what PMI, private mortgage insurance is if you get a loan for less than, is it 90% of the loan? I think so. Or 80% of the loan? It's one of those two. Um, but private mortgage insurance and what is the cost of that and how can that be minimized or avoided? So all of these things are important. Another important lesson is when your child is 18, they need a will and they need a power of attorney. Uh, especially the power of attorney I want to focus on here. The power of attorney is so important because you as parents do not have the right to make medical decisions for your child once they're 18 years old. So if there's a medical crisis, even a mental health crisis or a physical health crisis, you're not able to stand in and instruct them on what to do without the appropriate legal documentation. You can do this, um, relatively inexpensively, I would encourage you to go through, if you have an attorney that your family's working for, for your own documents, a will and power of attorney, by the way, mom and dad, you should have a will and a power of attorney. It should be up to date. It should be reflecting of what you actually want to have happen. But beyond that, you know, connect your kids to that attorney so that they can get the documents. If you don't have one, uh, an attorney that you're working with, as a worst case scenario, stopgap situation, you can use an online uh, package where you can get a, a, a will or a power of attorney. It is not the preferred or the ideal scenario, but as a, a economical way of doing a stopgap until they need to redo their documents once they're married, that could be a great way to go. And Tim, two other things. Um, we serve churches all across the country with our Life Institute Stewardship Lifestyle Seminar, and we work with attorneys all across the country. Reach out to us. We may know of an attorney in your area that we can get you connected with. That's a great point. And then also on top of that, we also partner with a national law firm that would be more than glad to step in and help out also. So if we can't find someone local, we know a Christian outfit that could actually step in and help out. And the last piece of uh, financial advice is if you're not in college, you should start saving for retirement now. If you're working, if you have earned income, yes. you're not going to college. That's not part of the deal. Maybe you finished college. Um, you need to be saving. You need to be remembering the lessons of compound interest, which we've talked about in past episodes. But put money in a Roth IRA. Save systematically. Save consistently because it will yield long-term, potentially significant benefit to you. 
during this time that they're at home, capitalize on teaching opportunities. Don't just do it for them. You know, when they were younger, you had to do a lot for them. Now that they're older, you may want to feel like you want to be hands off totally. Don't be hands off totally, especially when it comes to money, finances, and stewardship. Be involved, help educate them, teach them through the right and wrongs of, of being a good steward. At the same time, let them make mistakes. Absolutely. Right? You want to be hands on, yes. you want to help, but you yes. don't want to be a, a, a helicopter parent. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like micromanaging and nitpicking on every little thing they do. No, let you give them advice. They can take the advice or not take the advice and then let them experience some of the consequences as long as they're not like life threatening consequences, you know, especially when they're under your roof, it's safer for them to take some of that risk and learn some of those lessons and use those as great teaching opportunities. Absolutely. So Tim, we're going to shift now to the age 20 ish. Through yeah, 20s 39. to 30s, right? We're going to kind of pull that in. So what are some of the, what's, what's our first point, the big thing that we need to talk about? Yeah, I mean, really what we're dealing with now is kids who are out of the home, who are done with college, who are starting life on their own. Or it may be you listening right now. <laughs> That's right. Well, I think the first piece of advice that they need is uh, that little four-letter word that's more than four letters. <laughs> budget budget you need to talk to them about budget help them to learn how to create a budget and that can be really difficult especially you know okay truth moment here when i was in my 20s i i had a lot of financial acumen um having grown up in the family in which i grew up in uh, i was barely making ends meet uh, my wife and I were living in an apartment and, uh, you know, we were working two different jobs and we still didn't quite have enough. And I struggled with the give, save, spend offerings, luxuries. I always gave, but I struggled with the savings. And the problem wasn't so much that, that my spending was out of whack. My problem was that I didn't have enough income. The the problem there is that without savings, debt is going to be a reality. So helping them to understand the necessity of savings, not that, that, not that it's nice to have, not that there's, if there's money left at the end of the month, we're going to save, we're going to save first so that we can have reserves in the future. Part of that may mean doing something different to increase that income that is absolutely part of the part of the picture but the goal is to get yourself in a financial situation so that you can give save spend have offerings and luxuries and we want to allow them to learn lessons through the mistakes we mentioned that earlier just in the previous but again this is another time allow yeah. them to yeah. learn lessons through the mistakes that that <clears throat> and let me rephrase this mistakes in the past and even current and it's good for them to have those teaching moments and this would be good if if you have a child you're listening to it you have a child in this bracket share your stories what exactly, you've done exactly i think that's a critical piece i mean i know i've shared with my with my children my wife and i we're passionate about living debt free yeah, we want yeah. to this this is a conviction of ours and Though our children may not have that same conviction, they're seeing how we are living. And this is one of those situations where I think they've heard the words, but I think it's going to be caught more than taught in that, in that scenario. So it's good to be able to do that. And then also, we, you want to be able to, when they're in their 20s through early 30s, or talk to them about retirement planning. Tim, what are some of the key pieces there? So we talked about the magic of compound interest in a previous episode, episode 50, 10 episodes ago. Um, go back and listen to that. It's a good the one. The earlier you start, the better off you're going to be. So many, so many individuals that I meet who are in their 50s and 60s are like, oh, compound interest. If I had only done yes. when I was in my 20s and 30s, I would be in a vastly different place today, even with my meager Dollars, Absolutely. Yes. So, you know, realize the benefit of compounders is show them 
how compound interest works. Uh, use the episode 50 as a, as a guide. Another way that you can enforce this wise behavior of saving for retirement is to bless wisdom and not foolishness. How so? Well, here's the thing. Going back to, to the way my parents parented me and my siblings was that they said, here's the deal. If you will contribute to a Roth IRA up to a certain amount, and for him it was $1,000, if you put $1,000 into that Roth IRA, I know it's hard. It's a sacrifice for you to do that. I'm going to bless you with a $1,000 match to your Roth IRA. Can I be adopted? <laughs> There's a problem. It ended at 30 Oh, right. Man. He put limits on it. He was, he's wise. And that's fine. It's not an entitlement. He wanted to create habits of saving so that we would just set up those habits and allow those habits to carry us through the rest of our lives. And that's really the point. Yeah. If we can create those habits of saving when we don't have much money, it's, it's like Parkinson's law. Parkinson's law says that the expenses expand to the limit of the money that's available to it. Mm. It, it, That's, that's not exactly what Parkinson's law is, but that's one of the applications of Parkinson's law. Work expands, time expands to the amount allotted. So we need to have savings and live on the rest. And if we can do it when we have a little, we'll be able to do it when we have more and compound interest. That little bit that you save could potentially have significant long-term benefits to you as compounding takes effect. What's another thing that they can do for retirement planning? And it's really not just retirement. Yeah. yeah. Well, so, you know, within the confines of, of retirement planning, um, you tell your kids to take advantage of that retirement plan. Tell your kids, to take advantage of the employer match, the 401 case, get involved in that. That's, that's a no brainer. Help them figure out what investments to choose or point them to someone who can help them with that. Yes. One additional thing that would be wise, especially when thinking about college and, and, and loans is maybe do a match for 529 or Coverdale contributions. If they put a thousand dollars towards that, I'll match it for a thousand dollars up until a certain point. This allows you to, again, create the, the habit of savings and planning for the future. You're blessing wisdom. If they don't save, they're acting with some level of foolishness, then you're not going to bless them. There's a natural consequence for that. But if they're willing to sacrifice, they're willing to save you're going to bless that behavior. And because my dad did that, me and the rest of my siblings, I think we are in a different financial place today because of that incentive. Mm. And it was a good incentive. And it wasn't just for me. It was also for each of our spouses. Very nice. I know my wife and I've talked about it. Uh, We've shared in a previous podcast, my wife and I've just become grandparents and uh, our, our granddaughter is now about six weeks old, give or take, and we're already talking to our son and daughter-in-law about helping them start and contributing into a 529 or Coverdale for for our little granddaughter. So we're excited about being part of that journey and helping those pieces come together. So the next thing that we need to talk about are legal documents. You remember that in the last section, we said you need at least to have a power of attorney. You should have Minimum. a will too. But in your 20s and 30s, now you're getting married, Lord willing, mm-hmm. you're going to get married. It is essential, especially when you get married, start having kids, you have to have a will. Yes. Because you now own assets and those assets need to go somewhere and you need to plan ahead who's going to take care of it, especially with the kids. Who's going to take care of your kids? If you don't spell it out, you're going to let your family, her family and his family fight over the kids. Who's going to be the one to take care of them? And that's never a situation. You want your kids stuck in the middle of a family feud. So get a will decide on who the guardians and the trustees are going to be for the kids. It's so critically important. Yeah. And another thing that you need to have a conversation with them is about debt. Debt can cripple a couple. And there's a difference between good debt and bad debt. And we, I I want to encourage you as a parent, show them the difference, show them what you've done, even the mistakes that you've made in there. 
but maybe you can point them back to episode number 41 where we, where Tim and I actually talk about good debt and bad debt. And, and I think that's a good term to use there. And we want to encourage you to have that discussion with your children because debt can tie you down. And remember debt, you're borrowing from the future for something for today, which you're mortgaging your future for not just you, but your family. So it's one of those things to think about. And good debt will be a very positive thing for you. Bad debt will drag you down. So show them the difference and maybe even go back and re-listen to episode 41 prior to having that discussion. Yeah. Another thing that you need to keep in mind and encourage your kids with is they need life insurance, especially when there is you're married and you have kids or, or if you're single and you have kids. How are you going to provide for them who are dependent on your income? Life insurance is a essential part of one's financial plan to continue to provide ongoing for the financial needs of your family. Men often make the majority of the income in families, whether that's sexist or it's just it's that's a it's it's an objective fact. Now, if if that income goes away, guys, what does your wife need? She she doesn't just need a you know someone to put those cold feet on at, at bed at night. You know she she needs an income. Right. So at the end of the day, if you don't have life insurance, what is she going to do? She's got to put the kids up for adoption so that she can go back to the workforce, or she's got to go put an ad in the church bulletin looking for a husband. Did the church still have a bulletin? <laughs> Maybe, so that may be the, tough. So the point here is that you don't want to force her to make that decision unless she wants to. Right. Right. Yeah. You can have the life insurance that can provide for her. And we have other episodes where we've talked about life insurance. I refer you to those. And then we also want to encourage you to have that discussion about down payments on a house and be very careful about loans and gifts. If there's going to be a loan or a gift, make sure that you have that a a good detailed discussion and write stuff down, put things in writing. So there's no gray area between you and your child and maybe the siblings. It it needs to be very much out in the open when you have that conversation. Yeah. Yeah. If it's not written down, it never really happened. Exactly. So writing it down keeps your memory sharp and your, uh, your kids memories sharp. And don't be quick to loan money to your child. No, make it a last resort. Not saying that you should not, because we are to take care of our own household. Scripture makes that clear. But there's also understand the difference between needs and wants. A, a, a need of a home is one thing. A need of a 500000 or $700,000 home, that's a different story. So it's have those discussions with the children. Some and, zip codes, that's a slum. <laughs> well, not mine. So I'm not living, I'm not living there. So I'm not going to go there. Tim, let's shift. 40 plus All adult right. children, 40 plus. This is our last category. What are, what's the first thing that we need to have that discussion with our 40 plus, or maybe you are 40 plus that maybe your parents should have talked to you about. The reality here is that mom and dad, you're not getting any younger. You may be in your sixties, seventies, or eighties. And you're realizing that the time on this earth is coming to an end at some point over the next several years or decades. Why not let them experience, practice, have some of their inheritance now so that you can enjoy watching them use those funds and enjoy those funds? So Give them part of it now. And part of it is just to see what kind of wisdom do they demonstrate? Are they taking it and going out and blowing it at a casino? Or are they taking it and they're improving their family situation, maybe making improvements on their home or replacing a vehicle or whatever may need to be done? Look for wisdom so that you know how to guide, instruct, and continue to financially parent them. Another thing to do may be to give them a gifting gift. Ooh, I like that. So this is a gift not for them to take and use for their own personal enrichment, 
but to take and to give away so that you get to see how do they think through charitable giving? What are some of the things that they did? Uh, our producer, Tyler, has a story that we've shared in the past on the episodes. But Tyler, would you jump in and share maybe a Cliff Notes version of that for those who may have missed that previous version? Sure thing. Yeah. So my we got a, a note <laughs> coming through for a family meeting to get together with uh, grandparents. They wanted the whole family together. So we got together and they gave us a small sum of cash from one of their retirement accounts. And they said, hey, your job is to give all of this money away over the next six weeks or so. So we did that, right? After six weeks, we came back, we gave our little reports on how we were able to be generous and provide for those around us. And and they gave us a bigger sum of money that said, hey, this is a reward for your generosity. And um, at that point, they did what you guys are explaining to do, like encouraging us to save uh, to save for you know future house down payments or retirement or something like that. So it was a blessing to not only be able to be generous to people, but to also see how that can be rewarded in a really tangible way um, in this lifetime. It, it, it's like a mirror or a, a looking glass to see what's coming in the next. And Tyler, I know a few of your family members. They're part of my small group. And I must say, they the joy that they had in participating and being generous was off the charts. Oh, it was and, fun. Am I right in saying, I mean, I wasn't at your family meeting. I'm not part of your family, but it sounds like that time where you all came together and shared stories. It sounds like it was an amazing time. It was fun. I'm hoping my parents do the same and I, I can't wait to do the same with my family someday. It'd be great. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Amen. Another thing is, is discuss your estate with your adult children encourage them to update their legal docs to include their children in key roles, but let them know what you have and where it's at and all those details. Okay. So there, there are two things that you said here. I'm going to break them apart for simplicity. The first thing is that, um, we often use mushroom communication with our, with our family, right? We keep them in the dark and we feed them manure. And, and that is especially true with regard to one's estate plans. I don't know why why families or or some individuals feel like it's this closely guarded top secret document that you don't want anyone to know. Well, I, you know, oftentimes when that's the case, what happens is after you leave, the chaos begins. Yeah. Well, maybe maybe that's the case because they know chaos is going to happen one way or another. I don't know. I think the better option to do, especially with regard to loving your family, loving your children so that your children can continue loving each other after you're gone, is to talk about what it is that you want to happen. Are they going to be filling certain roles like executor or executrix? For your legal documents, for your estate, it would be good for them to know it, to know what the document says, and then maybe to know what's involved exactly. in the process, especially if there are um, items within your estate that may require special attention, whether it's property or you know specific collections that you may have that needs to be either distributed, distributed in a certain way or uh, to be sold in a particular manner in order to maximize value. These are all things that are so important for them to do. And then the second component is use that as a launching pad to say, hey, you should also update your documents. Now that the kids are in their 40s and beyond, their kids are now approaching the age of majority, your grandkids, right? They're approaching the age of majority. So for your children, they may want to update. I, I may not need a guardian anymore. Maybe I need to have um, my children listed as an executor if they're demonstrating wisdom and they have the maturity to be able to fulfill that role. So update those documents as life Happens. This is a good example, a good opportunity for a teaching moment to talk not only about your documents, but encourage them to keep theirs up to date. I was just with a lawyer. Uh, actually, last weekend, we were doing a seminar and the lawyer made it very clear. He said every five to seven or eight years is a good time to either review and or update your legal documents. Yeah, yeah. I thought that was wise in what he said, five to seven or eight years, review yeah. or update. Yep. So also, we want to encourage you, talk to your children about any charitable giving that's actually built into your estate plan. Tim, talk a little bit deeper about this. So we want to 
transfer not only valuables, we want to transfer values to our kids. And one of the most important values is the value of, of giving and being charitably inclined. And one of the ways that we can exhibit that in our life is to, to do some of the giving challenges like Tyler just talked about yeah, or to, um, to be involved in challenge grants and talk to your kids about how you're giving money away. You can also do it after you're gone. You can do it through specifically referencing charities as beneficiaries of IRA accounts and other taxable accounts. That could be a tremendously tax efficient way of doing some of your charitable giving. Or you could have a donor advised fund, which I think we've talked about before. We may be talking again in the future more about the benefits of a donor advised fund, uh, which allows them to do ongoing gifting for years and even decades after you're gone. If especially you have a large estate and you know, you want to give that money out, but over a long period of time. So talk to them about what the expectations are. How do you want the money given? To what kind of organizations do you want that money given? Is, is um, you know, the Humane Society okay? Or, or are you focused primarily on Christian organizations, ministries? What kind of organizations? Some of these things are important and helpful, especially in the training aspect for your children. And also part of that charitable giving and part of that giving within the estate plan is also you have a lot of physical assets and you need to plan that out. And it'd be good to have that discussion ahead of time so they know where some of these physical assets are going to go. Yeah. Well, where are they? <laughs> Number one, where so are some they? of yes. them, like their collection items or, you know, they may be you know safe deposit box. They need to know about those things. Yes. Um, but then how do they care for, especially if it's like a, a property Right. Uh, maybe it's a property that you intend to keep within your estate or to pass on through your, your estate. Start training them on how to take care of things, how to, you know, change the air filter and, you know, understand where the oil is and all of the various components of taking care of the property the way it needs to be maintained. And the bottom line is, especially at this age bracket, you want to impart wisdom, your life years of financial money, stewardship, wisdom into their lives. You want to impart that into them. You want to help them to see that through your years, this is what you have learned. This is what you have done. And this is how you want to encourage them to carry on some of those same pieces. So you want to instill in them, not just what the word of God says, but also how you have, you, you personally have lived this biblically financial stewardship lifestyle. Tim, what's the desired outcome? If someone would follow some of these pieces, what would be some of those outcomes? I think that the outcome would be you as a parent are going to have more confidence that your children are making decisions and able to carry on your legacy of financial and biblical stewardship after you're gone. I like that. And I, and I think that your children will gain a new appreciation for the ways in which the Lord has worked in your life, you and your spouse, and has shown faithfulness through the generations. And they can have the confidence to know that they can continue that legacy to their children and their children's children on through generations. That is my goal. That is, I believe, the biblical goal for family legacies. So I want to just kind of wrap this up. Here's our review of some of the key points. We want to encourage you to live out stewardship from a biblical base. We started off talking about some scripture. Make that a key part of who you are. And remember, stewardship can be more caught than taught. It is both, though. But sometimes your children, no matter what age they are at, they're watching what you do. And they're watching how you do it. And also find those opportunities, teach, teach, and teach again, and seek out opportunities to speak into your children to about the money, finances, and stewardship. Tim, you, you laid a really good, good case about blessing wise choices and investments while they're still around about pouring money into them as they are making wise choices into a Roth IRA or, or a 529 or whatever, come alongside and be a blessing to help them because that instills in them uh, that they're doing the right thing. And one thing we didn't mention, Tim, 
pray for them in this. Oh, yes. It's a critical piece. They need God's presence through and through in this decision-making process and pray for them that they make good, wise, and biblical decisions and then be available to them. Sometimes you may not be able to speak into them because they're not wanting or willing to hear, but if they're watching you and and seeing what you're doing in your life and they pop the question to you about money, finances, or stewardship, take the time, pour into them, speak into them, be available to them. Tim, any final thoughts or no, comments? I, I think this is a good, a good foundation to have some really helpful conversations. And it's not just conversations because also you may be listening right now and your parents haven't had that conversation with you. We've said this a few times. We want to say it one more time. Maybe we're the parents. Tim, you're a parent. I'm a parent. If your parents haven't poured into you these these things, let us take that little bit of a step and encourage you to take action on these things that you have not been taught. For sure. All right. Well, we want to thank you for joining us on this episode of the Stewardology Podcast. Don't forget to send us your questions and thoughts, comments, especially if you have ideas for future podcast episodes, questions that you have burning that you want us to be able to answer. And we've had quite a few come our way in the last couple of weeks. We're working on some of those episodes now, so you can look forward to that. Uh, take advantage of our free stewardship review. If you are looking at your situation, maybe your parents have not been there to give you that guidance and direction. This could be a really great way of getting some of the guidance that you need. And then again, go to our website for additional resources, stewardologypodcast.com. Don't forget to sign up for our newsletter. That way you're hearing all the announcements about our upcoming book in late 2022. All right. Until next time, take care. God bless. And don't forget, bless wisdom, not foolishness. Thank you for joining us on the Stewardology Podcast, where financial stewardship and theology meet. We'd like to help you take your next steps in biblical financial stewardship. First, subscribe in your podcast provider to get the newest episode delivered to you every week. Next, follow us on social media and visit our website at stewardologypodcast.com. There you can find our social media links and our entire episode archive. Remember, some trust in chariots and some trust in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. See you next week on the Stewardology Podcast. Securities and advisory services offered through Genius Wealth Management, member FINRA and SIPC.